Okay, so um, welcome to everyone attending the logistics and transportation stream. Um, here are some housekeeping notes before we start the session. So um, please use the chat function, of course, if you have any feedback uh, to send us messages rather than raising your hands. Um, um, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions via the Q&A function. Um, the session will include time for Q&As. Uh, some of them might be during the presentation and some after the presentation. You could also vote for questions to upweight them. Okay, so we, if we, uh, in, the, in the case that we may have more than one question, so I will be looking at those that they have more votes. Um, the, during the presentation, there will be a series of polls which will uh, pop up on your screen. Um, these are not accessible uh, via a browser. Um, a video of, of the session will be available right after the conference and we will communicate dates via the OR uh, Society website. Um, so our um, speaker uh, today, uh, we have invited Professor um, Joaquim uh, Gromicho. Um, the, um, the title of the talk is Optimization Stories in Logistics and Transportation Featuring Python. Um, I will introduce him briefly, but he's going to introduce himself as well. Uh, professor uh, Joaquim Gromicho is a professor of Applied Optimization in Operations Research at um, Vrije University in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, he is also a scientific and education officer at Ortec, a very well-known company uh, in the Netherlands. So the floor is yours, uh, Professor uh, Joaquim Gromici. Please um, go ahead. Thank you very much, Hamed, and uh, thank you very much to the War Society for this wonderful opportunity to address so many people from my home working room. It uh, feels quite strange to be in a conference like this, but I guess that the whole world and um, talking to the OR Society is a great privilege for me. But as I said, my thanks go mostly to Hamed because uh, he is the one that invited me to uh, do this uh, talk for you today. So um, I was already briefly introduced. Thank you, Hamed, for that. I think that the fact that we are not able to have like a chat on the coffee corner like we used to have should not prevent us from getting to know a little bit each other. So about me, um, I was born in Portugal. Um, I uh, have spent half of my life in my home country and half of my life in the country where I live now. I'm in the Netherlands. I came to the Netherlands for my PhD and then afterwards I returned to join Ortec. Ortec has been my uh, main employer since almost 24 years. It will be 24 of October, very soon, that I joined Ortec. It's a company where I have done many things and my present uh, roles are those of a scientific and education officer, which actually means that at Ortec I'm responsible for what we do with universities and for our internal and external education programs. And I'm also part of the work council of uh, Ortec, the works council. So the education factory, which has just popped up, is our internal education uh, institution for our colleagues. I'm going to be teaching within the education factory tomorrow for eight consecutive hours. And the Analytics Academy is something that uh, the Ortec and the University of Amsterdam have set up, uh, which is actually a company that sells education to whoever wants to buy it in analytics. I'm also an endowed professor in applied optimization in operations research at the School of Business and Economics of the VU. And because I do like to bridge, let's say, between theory and practice of OR, I would like to highlight those two activities. I'm the editor of, in chief of Stator, which is the glossy of the Dutch OR Society, which somehow is our own version of your impact magazine. Um, of course, that your impact magazine has a much bigger impact because uh, British are the lucky spoke speakers of the truly universal language and stutter is in Dutch, but still it is a nice magazine for those that can read it. Besides that, I'm also a member of the steering committee of the youngest uh, working group within the Euro, which is the working group on the practice of operations research. Um, our chair lady has been chair lady of the OR Society previously, 
So I have been dealing with OR society somehow, but it's the first time I have the privilege to participate like today. So um, about me and about the things I do professionally, as, I, as you see, I serve many, many uh, institutions and I heard this morning, so you are the first ones to hear that, that I will be actually moving from the view to the University of Amsterdam, uh, where I will take the chair on business analytics. So that's um, something that got confirmed for me this morning. All right, so I serve many institutions, but in fact, uh, my services go mostly to these four ladies, which uh, on the left of the screen is the main reason for me to have moved back to the Netherlands and the three daughters that we got together. So I'm a minority at home, uh, even the cat is a lady, but fortunately those two hamsters that just joined our family recently are gentlemen, so I do not feel completely alone in gender. All right, so about this tutorial. Um, I will briefly tell you what the tutorial is all about and because there are of course parallel streams in one minute you will know whether you made the right choice for being here but thank you very much for being here anyhow so what i would like to uh, to re to achieve today i would like to appeal during this tutorial to both the curious and the trained professionals being those either in mathematical optimization which is likely given that this is a congress of a congress of the or society or being skilled in python so I hope that the, regardless of your level of skill in either mathematical optimization of Python, that you will find something of interest during my presentation. I will basically try to highlight the value of optimization and the magic of proven optimality, meaning that most of what I will be covering addresses modeling and solving mathematical optimization problems in Python. Uh, so, uh, and I will do that via stories, which will try to teach how to model business situations in a way to enable optimization in Python, which will be used as a modeling and resolution tool. Uh, we will also learn how to understand and interpret those solutions that Python produces. And we will briefly introduce a simple methodology to deal with uncertainties. And because uncertainty is why, because we live in, a, in the data of, uh, in the era of data science, uh, most of us are now exposed to a lot of relevant data, but somehow we cannot trust all the data that we get. So there are uncertainties in our models, anyhow. Uh, intentionally, there will not too much focus on, on routing, but we will end on some routing today and relax, the tempo will be high but you may indeed ask me for the material that slide has been actually a little bit outdated uh, because in fact the material will be made available to you by the OR society so um, as you can see on your screen now uh, there is a url that should be available uh, to you uh, which is the one that you can copy over there and from that URL, you will be able to download the zip, including the notebooks that will be used today, and also a PDF version of this slide deck. Uh, there is also a, a link on the schedule page of this tutorial, but when I looked just before starting, the link was still pointing to a previous version, uh, which, well, some last minute preparations, and it has been uh, renewed. Good, uh, either via the schedule page or via the URL that is on your screen, you should be able to obtain the material. So that being said, uh, this is more or less an introduction to what I will be doing. So I'm actually curious, now that you know what you signed for, um, I would like to uh, start with a very small poll where you will be given the opportunity to tell me whether you will stay or you will leave. I'm just very curious. Oh, okay. So, excellent, excellent. So I think that most of you still feel like you got what you signed for. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your trust. So let's move on. And what I would like to do now is, um, I will minimize the poll screen. I would like to tell you the first story. And the first story revolves around Alice. So Alice is a little girl, a little girl that was once very, very happy by receiving a rose. And that rose made her so happy that she decided to took very good care of it. 
and she immediately searched for a vase. And she could not find a vase, but she found a laminate glass. But okay, it was a single rose, a long-stemmed rose, so she thought it will work fine. I will put it in my glass. Problem is that because the rose was so long-stemmed, it actually fell off. And she thought, well, if an empty glass is not stable enough, I will add some water to it, which is also good for the rose. So she did indeed add some water to the, to the glass at the construction state. And then she thought, well, a bit of water helps, so I will fill up the glass. And then she was surprised because everything fell. And it was just as unstable, just a bit more wet than before. So now Helis has a challenge to solve. She noticed that an empty glass was unstable, a glass with some water was stable, so a glass full of water was unstable again. Now she wants to know what's the optimal level of water. So that's, of course, what we are all dealing with in our professions. We want to solve problems to optimality. So the key concept of this story is the center of gravity of the construction, which is basically composed of the glass, which is a cylinder. Uh, if we just abstract a little bit the fact that there is a bottom of it, then there will be a center of gravity half away the height of the, of the glass. And there will be, of course, a cylinder of water inside the glass, which also has a center of gravity half away its own height. But what Alice wants is to know where is the center of gravity of those two bodies together. And that relates very much to how bod bodies should be balanced on a lever. And as a good girl, she knows exactly how to do that. If she sits on a, six, on a jigsaw, then you, you know uh, that on a seesaw, you need to be closer to the fulcrum if you have a higher mass than the player. So uh, she looked it up and all the formula have been discovered long ago by Archimedes. And that is basically a proportionality. So now she knows exactly how to compute the center of gravity of the glass with water. And she uh, measures her glass, it's 20 centimeter tall, it's four centimeter wide, it weighs 100 gram. And with her simple calculator, she was able to compute and to plot some individual heights for the center of gravity of a glass with water. So she can immediately see that there will be a minimum somewhere around six or eight uh, height. Sorry, uh, I came to interrupt. And of course, it's the individual observations are just part of a bigger story. There is a function and she can actually compute that function analytically. Okay, sorry, I came to interrupt. Um, yes. Um, yes. So it seems that when you move forward and backward, the sound yeah. sometimes is audible and, some, and sometimes it's not. So. Um, some of the um, attendees, they have raised this issue. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry for that. I did not know of that. So it happens when I move my head. Probably, I don't know. I, mean, I will I try not to move, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I will proceed from here because if I go back, we will run out of time. It's still, it was, audible. I mean, we were able to hear you. It's just sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's more louder than, than at some moment. So it should be fine. Thank now. you very much, Ahmed. Thank I will you. try to talk in the same direction. Uh, well, so Joachim, so, Joachim, sorry, it might be due to the fan noise from your computer. I don't know whether you've unplugged it. I've unplugged it. I've unplugged okay. it. Okay, great. All right. So uh, what Alice noticed is that there is, of course, this function which tells the whole story. And for that function, she wants to spot the minimum. And she looked a little bit further and she found that Fermat has taught us how to do that. We can basically do that by finding the derivative of that function, setting it to zero, and the minima will be among those points. And then she sat for a longer, for a little longer, and she could find that the minimum will be at one third of the height, so at 20 thirds, and full of confidence, she knows there will not be a better solution for the problem. So basically, what we have just learned is that indeed, Mathematical optimization is all about decision variables. That's what we can control. Alice could control the amount of water in the glass and their decision variable was the height of water in the glass. An objective function, which is in this case, the height of the center of gravity of the glass with water. Some functional constraints, which in their case, which in her case means that she cannot put negative water and not more than 20 centimeters of height of water in the glass. And the aim for the objective, she wants to lower that center of gravity. Mathematicians found ways to describe optimal solutions, which is of course very important if we are looking for them. 
and it is sometimes possible just to solve mathematical optimization problems analytically. And what is even more important than that, nothing beats an optimum. So Alice was very, very happy to learn all this. And I would like to mention the book that you see now on the top right corner. On that book, the same story is told, but then Alice is called Samantha, because that story was a real story about the daughter of Jan Brinkhaus, one of the writers of that very inspiring book, which covers optimization, but not Python. All right. So um, this talk is about optimization. It's also about logistics. Logistics is more complex than, uh, than uh, glasses of water to put roses in it. And it's about Python. So we will now move towards Python. We will start to put our hands on optimization in Python. And I wonder whether you felt like, why should I ever learn another language? Well, the good news is that Python is a good choice. Uh, KD Nuggets is an institution that you may uh, find easily on, on internet, which is actually always busy trying to spot trends in uh, analytics. They noticed already back to in 2017 that most of the analytics professionals were either using R or Python, and then there were a minority using other tools. And we can see from 2016 to 17 that Python started really taking over, and that trend has been has been the same for the last few years. So um, I would imagine that depending on whether you are a professional in analytics from the descriptive arena or the prescriptive arena, that's where we do the optimization, that you either discovered R or Python, because R is like, let's say, the answer to uh, those that want to have a free SPSS, and Python is like maybe the, one of the answers to those that want to have a free MATLAB. And then there are all those that are those crowds over there, down there, that learned other languages. But still, Python is a very good choice. And it may be that Julia, who has been created and promoted by the MIT, will take over. But I think it's going to be hard because the community of Python is so established already. All right. So it is about Python today, but it will be mostly about Pyomo, which is one of the packages available to the Python users for mathematical modeling. So uh, Pyomo is the choice I made to um, support all my notebooks that I will be illustrating. And it is, uh, I think, a very good choice because there are books on Pyomo. There are huge amount of information on the internet that you can easily find. And it is indeed very, very solid. Very good. All right. I will be showing notebooks. Those of you that already run Python uh, may or may not have the Anaconda distribution. If you do have the Anaconda distribution, you are familiar with this screen and you know how to start your Jupyter notebooks. You will not be doing this interactively with me because you did not get them yet, but I hope that if you like this stuff that you will open my notebooks offline afterwards. So then you basically need to uh, press that button over there. And if you do that, you will be able to launch your notebooks on a browser. So this is a good moment to open the Alice notebook. And I will do that by moving to a browser, which is nowadays still, at this moment still showing uh, the page of this, um, of this session, which includes the link where you may find a package of files. And I will open the first notebook. Those that do not know notebooks, um, I will briefly introduce them. It's basically a collection of cells, and you see here some cells, and the cells can be of different types. The type markdown, which is a type of this one, is basically very simple text, which will be formatted for you. That very simple text has some rules, and the rules, if you get the notebooks and if you follow these algorithms, you will find like pages explaining you all about Markdown, including a Wikipedia page. The rules are simple and allow you to make beautiful text. Beautiful text that even may include a subset of LaTeX. So, all right, so you can, as a notebook, as a real notebook, you can write text. But more than that, you can run a language. And uh, I will be running Python, but you can actually add almost any conceivable languages to this environment. Um, because this notebook will actually show pictures, we will need this funny looking statement. Things that start with a percentage sign are called magics. And if you follow this link, you will have a list of many magics that you can run. But this is actually a statement that tells my notebook 
that when I will have code that produces graphics, I should see the result of those graphics on my notebook. All right. Python is a language and it is also kind of a philosophy. Python programmers call themselves Pythonics. And if you would like to know what that means, you can follow this link. That's something for you. Or you can uncomment this and see what happens. I will not do that. I will leave that winking eye for later. In Python, you basically use whatever uh, the language offers to you and you can add functionality by importing packages. So I will be using these two packages now. This package is called SIMP, which stands for Symbolic Mathematics in Python. Those that uh, know and love Mathematica uh, will probably feel reassured to know that indeed there is some support for Symbolic Mathematics in Python. And I will be illustrating it to solve uh, the problem that Alice has solved symbolically as well. So um, this is also an illustration that in a notebook you can do beautiful things, you can have formatted text, you can have LaTeX symbols, and you can have pictures, even LaTeX formulas, and all right. So now we go towards code. So here, right here, I'm starting to use SIMPY, and I'm declaring X to be a symbol, which I actually call X. So basically from this moment onwards, X is a variable, which is a symbolic variable. And as you may see here, pi is a number because the math package uh, has a symbol pi, which is actually a number. So I have here a formula, which is the formula, which is standing right over there, the objective function of Alice, which is the formula for the height of the center of gravity of the glass with water. And I can ask simply, to solve the equation that equates the derivative of h to x to solve it, to a, the derivative taken on x and to solve it for x. So basically what I get here is, I would have get it if I would have run all the cells. This is what happens when I talk and I don't do what I should. So there were undefined symbols because I did not run the previous cells, now I did. So now my notebook knows what SIMP is, what math is and so forth. And it could solve this and it could tell me there are two solutions. One is absence to be negative, which is not feasible for Alice. And the other one is positive and it is what Alice already has found. But since I announced to you that Python also supports symbolic mathematics, then you probably would like to have pi as a symbol, which is not too difficult because you just ask pi not to be a number, but to be a symbol. So you ask it to come from simpy. And then you will have a pi with a letter, Greek letter pi. And then if you have like this solution being solved, uh, this equation being solved again, you get like an analytic solution. All right. So, um, you have seen a lot of LaTeX appearing, appearing in my notebook, kind of mysteriously. You can actually force it to happen. You can uh, use the high, uh, the high Python kernel and uh, force LaTeX to happen, like I showed here. Um, so now I had a solution which was symbolic and I would like to have the number again. I don't need to copy and paste code. I can basically ask the symbolic solution to replace my symbol pi by by number pi which comes from the mathematical package and evaluate the solution and then i get here which is the result of this statement that shows me the symbolic solution and i get here the single positive number that is solution to that equation because i'm taking the max of those two all right so this is already a demonstration of some python symbolic and numeric and we have seen a picture on my slide deck. We can also see a picture on the notebook because we can actually draw pictures very easily in using the mathplotlib package. So we see a picture of the function with the minimum on it. But this was a symbolic part. What if we only care about the numerical solution? Then you meet Pyomo. So this is the first entrance of Pyomo, which will be with us today. Pyomo enters here to solve Alice's problem. And how do we do that? We uh, declare a model. I'm gonna call it Alice. I will have a variable in my model, which will be bounded from zero to 20. There will be an objective, which I call the center of gravity, which has as an expression with a familiar function by now, and I will be actually minimizing this function. So if I pretty print, which is just a bit of text in that model, it will basically tell me some text describing the model, which is over there. 
The fun thing about Pyomo is that it actually is able also to run on solvers that are on the internet. You may know that there is a Neo solver, the Neo server, which hosts a lot of solvers. I will be asking the Neo server to run IPOPT, which is an interior point optimization method implemented in the IPOPT solver to solve this problem. And this is, of course, the time it takes is a random variable, depends on the internet latency, depends on the load of the Neo server, server. So I will not be doing this too often. I just want to illustrate that it actually can be done. I hope it will not take too long. Um, and if it runs, then you will get the solution, which was com computed analytically. And then you can also query the variables by asking the value and asking the value of the center of gravity, which is an exp expression for which you get this value. So um, I'm afraid that I don't know exactly how long NEOs will take to uh, answer this. So this will be a right moment for a very short Q&A. Are there already Q and A's being uh, asked, uh, Hamed. Uh, Q's being asked. So I cannot see any questions yet. So if anyone would like to ask any questions, please use the Q and A, um, and feel free to ask your question. Otherwise, if there are no questions yet, because this is probably quite simple, then we proceed. At a given moment, there will be an answer here, but as I said, it's a wonderful blessing. So the question is, Yes. what is the protocol for um, leveraging uh, online solvers? Uh, the protocol is actually implemented in an opaque fashion by, by PyOMO. Um, uh, I do not know the details of the protocol being implemented. The blessing is that I don't need to know. So the only thing I need to know is how to, um, how to leverage it. So uh, basically, I will ask from the solver manager factory to uh, access the NEOS uh, solver manager. And for on that, I will ask uh, that solver manager factory that gave me access to the NEOS server to solve the Alice model using this solver. So this is the way that I basically access it. And what is happening uh, underwater, it's completely opaque to me. What I will show in the next story is the list of solvers that I will be having on, on my own machine, uh, which is depends on your licenses, and the list of solvers that I will be also have uh, on NEOS. So at one moment in time, this will return, and sometimes it takes like a split second, sometimes it takes minutes. It uh, depends on the load that NEOS has at this moment. Um, all right, I don't know whether there are any other urgent questions, otherwise, oh, okay, there was something happening, so let's go back, let's go back. So um, what we could see is that it took two minutes and 40 seconds to actually solve the problem. And the problem was solved for that value of the height of water. And I see it here again, because now that the problem has been solved, I can actually ask the model to display, which is a simplified view with only numbers, and I can access the variables and objects. All right, so if, we have met Alice and we have seen her story and seen the solution to her problem in Python, I will add a little bit to the complexity by moving towards Betty. Betty uh, wants to build a cylinder. And in order to build a cylinder, she needs to decide on the height and on the radius of the cylinder, but it should be such that the volume is maximum with some constraints. She only has limited material and she expresses the constraint of the limited material in terms of the surface of the material. So um, she has also decision variables. Alice had one, she has two. The decision variables are now the radius of the cylinder and the height of the cylinder. They should be non-negative. Uh, the surface should not exceed 12. She wants to maximize the volume. And um, Alice dealt with center of gravity and uh, balancing bodies. So now um, Betty, deals with some geometry. So basically she wants to understand what is the volume of the surface of a cylinder and she could do a very simple experimentation like printing this slide and cutting what you see and then assembling it. Is, you get a cylinder but you also get the picture that indeed the cylinder is a rectangle and two circles so therefore the volume will be the product of the surface of the circle, of one of the circles, they are equal, times the height of the cylinder, which is, let's say, the width of the rectangle. And the 
other dimension of the rectangle is equal to the perimeter of the circle, so there is no variable over there. So uh, what, we, what we need to do is to limit the surface, which is uh, the surface of two circles and the surface of the rectangle, which is the rectangle itself is 2 pi r times h, because 2 pi r is the perimeter of the circle, which is that other dimension of the, that other length of the, of the rectangle. And then we have the surface. We also have the volume, which is pi r square h, and this is the model that we want to solve. We want to maximize pi r square h under the constraints that 2 pi r square plus 2 pi r h is less or equal than 12, r is bigger or equal than 0, and h is bigger or equal than 0. Of course, that if we think about this problem, it's very easy to solve analytically as well, because we do realize that the volume and the surface will grow together. So in the optimum, the inequality will be binding, it will be an equality. We can solve for one of the variables. We will end up having a problem on one single variable. We, uh, we end up translating the story of Betty into the story of Alice, and we solve it with Fermat, and then we get the solution. But now we are to solve mathematical optimization problems with constraints. Fortunately, Lagrange taught us how to do that for um, equality constraints, and Carouche discovered how to do that for inequalities. Of course, that the work of Carouche was rediscovered by Kuhn and Tucker, and now we know the theorem by the theorem of Carouche and Tucker, which basically says you notice that you are on an optimum when you get stuck. And that's how a solver notices that it is it is on an optimum where no improving so direction will remain feasible. And that is a story that can be told in terms of intersection of cones. It is also an algebraic story, but the good thing is that's all in the solver and the optimality is proven. It's proven lo locally, but it is also globally if the problem has the desired properties. Well, that's the moment to go to Betty's notebook. And Betty's notebook that you will also get is uh, a notebook that will tell the story of Betty, but then solving it, of course, with Bayon. And what we can see here is that we do basically the same. We declare a model, we um, add variables to the model, those variables will be in the domain of the non-negative reals, there will be an objective function, which I call volume, which will have as an expression the proper mathematic function, and it will be minimized. And there will be a constraint which basically says that the surface, which is this expression, should be less or equal than 12. So this feels more or less not like natural language. And I'm not going to do this one here because that one uh, took the last time one minute and three seconds to go through NEOs. I'm actually not going to do this one because it's also going to NEOs in order to query NEOs and query my system. So this is the list of solvers that you can address on NEOs using Pyomo. So you will recognize many solvers here, including Cplex. Cplex is completely free to use from the NEO solver. And you see many other known solvers. And more, more important for the rest of today is that I do have also some solvers on my machine. Those with a plus or with a star are available on my machine. So now I will proceed to this cell where I will be solving Betty's problem with my local IP, which just took a second and we found the solution, exhausting all the surface and indeed the maximum volume. So this will be a moment for a second Q&A if there is any. Otherwise, I have more stories to tell. Any Q? Okay, so um, the question is, a, um, how would you compare a software like um, Bayomo with commercial uh, solvers like Ruby? Uh, there is, uh, that is a very good question, but there is a very clear distinction between Bayomo and Ruby. Ruby is a solver, in my opinion, maybe the best solver in his class, um, which also includes a Python dialect. So indeed, you can model in, Py, in Gurobi's Python, and then you will be bound to Gurobi because you basically talk to Gurobi in his own Python dialect. That's what Pyomo actually offers you. It will completely isolate you from the solver choice. I will be using Gurobi later on, and uh, I will be using Gurobi indistinguishably with GLPK, with CBC, with Cplex, with, with any other solver which is able to address the same type of problems as those that Gurobi solves. 
And the thing is that I will not change anything on my modeling. And you will need to, if you start modeling against Gurobi in the Python dialect of Gurobi, and you realize that you want to move to Cplex for any reason. So that's the, basically the blessing of Payomo. Another blessing of Payomo, which I will probably not touch too much, is that it includes many, many abstractions that uh, Gurobi does not. For instance, if your problem is very structured, like in stochastic optimization, like you have blocks, or if you have a problem that includes many, many sub-problems in it and you want to decompose, it is very, very easy to leverage that from Payomo if you know what you are doing. Any other question for now? Um, I think so. That's the question. Thank you. All right. So in that case, uh, let's move. We have seen Alice. We have seen Betty. Now we are at Caroline. Caroline is a very, very, uh, let's say, entrepreneurial girl. She has a factory. So we are finally reaching logistics. And basically, we have reached logistics at the level of production planning. So Caroline, she produces two types of trophies, uh, football trophies and golf trophies. We are looking at the golf trophy on the screen. Both trophies, they consume wood. Uh, both trophies, they use a plaque that will be engraved for the customer on, uh, on the moment that it will be actually sold. And they consume a ball being the football trophy with the bronze ball, with the brass ball on it and the golf trophy with the golf ball like the one we see on the screen. The wood consumption is four decimeters for the football and two decimeters for the golf. And there is, of course, um, a profit uh, by selling a football trophy. She uh, earns 12 euro and by selling a golf trophy, she earns nine euro. She has the materials she needs. She has some, some kind of inventory at the moment, some level of inventory, and that is 1,000 footballs, 1,500 golf balls, 1,750 plagues, and 480 decimeter, uh, eight meters of wood, which is 4,800 decimeters of wood. And of course, she wants to have the optimal production plan. We know very well how to do this. We know very well how to do this because uh, Mr. Kantorovich, Professor Kantorovich, taught us how to model linear programs, which eventually yield in a Nobel Prize in economics. It all starts with naming your decisions, and we would uh, name our decisions as trained uh, operations researchers like X1 and X2, and that will be respectively the number of football trophies to produce and golf trophies to produce. And then Caroline's optimization problem reads like maximize the total profits, which, which is 12 pairs football trophy, nine pair golf trophy, such that she does not consume too many footballs. There will be one football pair football trophy. There will be one golf ball pair, pair golf trophy. There will be one plague pair trophy, and there will be four decimeters of wood per football trophy and two decimeters of wood per golf trophy. And she should not produce negative quantities. So this is her problem. And of course that we know that the problem with two variables can be solved graphically and then we also know that we have spotted the Karushkan Tucker optimum and that the optimal solution in this case is 650 and 1100. And it's very useful to know that up front because then we know whether our notebook is going to tell us the right thing. So uh, basically, Caroline should uh, produce 650 football trophies and produce 1100 golf trophies using all but 350 brass footballs, using all but 400 golf balls, and she would get a total profit of 17,700 euro. So this is the moment to open Caroline's notebook. So Caroline's notebook, uh, of course, starts by including the necessary packages. It tells her story again. And as we see, it's very, very easy to express such a linear optimization problem. We express such a linear optimization problem by declaring the variables. I'm not calling them x1 and x2 intentionally here because you can call variables anything you like. There will be the football and the golf variable, which will be in the domain of the non-negative uh, reals. The profit of Caroline's problem is indeed 12 times the number of footballs plus nine times the number of golf balls. And we want to maximize now. You have seen these symbols without this namespacing because before I was importing all the symbols from Pyoma environment. But that's actually something I don't like to do because it pollutes all my namespace. So from this third notebook onwards, I start importing uh, environments. Uh, and using them to access the symbols. And I just, in this case, I summarize Pyoma environment as PyO in the same way as I also summarize PyPlot from Matplotlib as PLT. 
So um, what I'm doing here is that I get the sense of, my, of optimization from PIO, and I also get the variables, the variable objects from PIO, and so forth. So I have an objective function. I have a constraint, which is just the number of footballs being less or equal than 1,000. This reads exactly like that. So what we see here on top, we see here on the bottom, and it uh, maps one to one. And as you uh, may know, IP opt is a generic mathematical optimization problem, so it also solves linear problems, and it does. Uh, and I get out of it a solution, which is the solution I was expecting, 650, 1100, for respectively the number of football and golf trophies. The thing is that the question I got before uh, regarding why should I care about Pyoma if I have Gurabi, is that if I want to solve the same model with another solver, I don't recode. Oh, I should not have done this. I'm going to Neos. I'm sorry about that. So what I'm going to do now, because I don't know how long this will take, I'm going to just kill my kernel. Otherwise, I will be waiting. So what I did is that I interrupted everything. So now I go up, I declare my symbols again. And what I will be doing, ah, I should not be talking, I should not be typing while I talk because, oh no, wait a second, this was wonderful, this was wonderful. No, it's not. Neos is still waiting. I will kill it again. Sorry for that, I should not talk and type. I will now type and not talk. Now I will not run this cell, not run this cell, but I will run this cell. So on this cell, I'm actually using one of the solvers on my computer, which is CBC. CBC is unknown to Payomo because I got it with another package. I got it with Pulp, but I can actually tell Payomo where the executable is and it will find it. But there are other solvers which are known to Payomo, like GLPK, which is a free solver for linear optimization. And it gives the same solution as CBC, of course. And now the solutions are numerically stable because I'm using linear optimization solvers. Cplex also gives the same solution, but this is now the local Cplex on my machine. That's the difference between these calls through the solver factory, it's local. And also Gurobi. And uh, this is an illustration of how you get immunized from the solver choice. There is one single declaration of Caroline's model, which is here. And there were many, many solutions by many, many solvers, including IPOPT. So now that we have solved uh, the problem many times, actually, uh, and we have always seen the solution by doing a display of the model, now we can proceed and uh, learn how to access individual, the individual values. Of course, we have seen before that we can ask the value of a variable. I'm doing that here. We have seen before that you can ask the variable, which is healed by the expression of the objective function, which I'm doing here. And I got this bit. But what is also fun is that if the model is unknown to you, you can actually query the model. So what I'm doing here, I'm actually asking the model, I'm asking the model, tell me your variables, and I'm listing here the variable names and values, tell me your um, objectives, because you may have multiple objective functions in Pyomo. There is one objective, which is the profit with this value, and tell me your constraints, uh, which are those. And I, I, I decided to show the slacks, the upper slacks of those constraints. So I can actually query models that I do not know and uh, still access the models. More interesting, I can also access the dual information. Of course, you could dualize Caroline's problem and solve it directly, but if you just ask the Caroline model to ask for the dual from the solver, and regardless of the solver that you ask, I will illustrate with CBC, if you put here the dual uh, being uh, a suffix that imports the dual from the solver, then you will get the dual solution once you solve the primal. And I'm illustrating here how to access those dual variables. And I'm also illustrating something else, which is another package from Python, which uh, for those used to MATLAB is the same as doing the rational functionality. I am converting those numbers, which are the shadow prices of the problem into um, fractions. So this was Caroline's story. And the goal of Caroline's story was to illustrate the first linear optimization problem to illustrate how to uh, solve it using different solvers and how to access dual information. 
So this is a good moment for another short Q and A, if there is one. So at the moment there is no questions, but probably we may want to leave the questions at the end of the presentation because there is only right. now 15 minutes, uh, less than 15 minutes left. Okay, so I have to rush. So um, the next story, it will be the story of Dick. And the story of Dick is about feasibility. And it's also a little bit of network problem in disguise, by the way. So um, Dick owns a restaurant and Caroline wants to use Dick's restaurant to celebrate uh, profits from uh, selling or all the trophies that she made. And she wants to do it in, of course, in a, in a way that is, it respects all the social distancing that takes, Dick takes care of it. But she asks Dick, why don't you also promote interaction? So let's make sure that no more than K members of the same family will be sitting at the same table. And in that case, uh, Dick needs to know how many members are of each family, that you see the six, the eight, the two, the nine, and so forth. And how many, how, how many seats can I sit at the table in a responsible way? And what is the K desired by Caroline? It will be three. So I'm gonna go to Dick's um, notebook. Dick's notebook basically um, models the problem. Of course, the table seat in simple variant, which is just a network flow problem, by the way, in disguise. So I will have a model. I will have variables which will be, sorry, I will have um, a kind of, um, a kind of an index for the families which will be arranged uh, up to the number of families and kind of an index for the tables. And I will have variables which will be indexed. So therefore this X is a matrix, a matrix with families as rows and tables as columns. The variables are bounded from zero to K. That's the way that I will not sit more than K members of the same family at the same table. And the objective function is irrelevant because this is just a problem of feasibility. I want to have a feasible sitting plan. And I want to sit every member of the families respecting the capacity of the tables everybody should be seated. So this is a very straightforward uh, model, which I can formulate, and then I can solve with the data given, and I will be using GLPK for this example. And what I will see is that I will get an optimal solution. And that optimal solution is displayed here. And I'm now using something that the Python programmers know very well, which is a data frame. I'm now using a data frame for the first time and I'm using it just to show the table of the seat plan, which basically says how many members of each family go to each table and so forth. And the second version is a version that adds the first binary variable of today in order to minimize the number of used tables in case that we have enough tables, in case we have redundant tables. So there will be no longer a flow problem, but a a problem with binary variables. So this is the Dick story. Um, I would like to briefly ask you in a poll, whether you, do you always trust your data? A very short poll, please. So basically I ask you, do you always trust your data? Uh, and there are three answers to choose from. The most popular one is I sometimes feel that the optimum is useless if the data is wrong. I agree with you. And there are some people that do trust the data because they focus on the optimization, which is already hard enough. And of course, that implicitly they say that the data scientists should take care of the data. But you may or may not know that there are ways to deal with uncertainties in data. My favorite one is called robust optimization. I would like to defer to this excellent talk that was given in the previous Euro Congress in Dublin. So um, this is something you can do offline, but I will illustrate uncertainties in the data with Caroline's story. And Caroline's story basically goes on by um, realizing that the cuts of wood are probably prone to errors. So she measured the wood that was cut for golf trophies. It was centered in the two that should be, but there were some deviations. And also for the football trophy, there were some deviations. And the data scientists that she hired noticed that the previous observations all inside that rectangle. And then the optimization expert formulated a robust model. And you will see the details of it if you, um, if you uh, open uh, Caroline's um, story, which I will do via another way. Um, sorry, not Caroline's story. I'm already at Elson Fiona's story. And what you see here 
is that we will start by doing some sim simulation of data uh, science because I'm not, I don't have a sample, but what I do have is the ability to generate data. I generate some random observations for the cuts for wood of, for football and golf trophies. And then uh, I get uh, these type of observations. And I realize that indeed I can be in trouble because if I compare what I did consume with what I should have consumed if the nominal values could be trusted, I will be actually consuming too much wood most often. So indeed, I will be in trouble. So um, what I have here is uh, so far a little bit of a story of uh, data science in miniature. And now I realize that I should have like a, a region of uncertainty for the cuts of wood for the football trophy, for the golf trophy, like those numbers over there. So the model should be robust, and this is an example of box uncertainty for those that will follow the, the wonderful talk by Dick Van Ertog. So um, what I have is that I would like to have the constraint of the woodcut to hold for all the possible cuts that are observed within the uncertainty set. And a very simple application of linear duality will go from this constraint, which is basically equivalent to this maximum here, to this minimum here, which is dualizing locally over here. And basically what I say is that I want to have this minimum below this, which is saying that there will be a feasible solution on this problem with it below that. And then I get rid of the local optimization and my problem becomes only one of feasibility, which is the magic of robust optimization. And if you follow the rest of this notebook, you will see that I get a reformulation of Caroline's problem that actually uses data structures. Now I have X variables which are indexed. They don't have a name for their own. So this is more like a structured formulation. And with this structured formulation, I can basically add the robustness by adding the proper variables and the proper constraint. And I'm able to add uncertainty to the problem and see how the problem reacts. And most interestingly, if you go all the way down, you notice that box uncertainty is a special case of polyhedral uncertainty, meaning that duality preserves linear optimization. So you can actually ask for an uh, integral solution for this problem. You will be within the domain of the MILP solvers and you will get uh, solutions that are integral and you can try different deltas, different uncertainties. And because Ahmed was so kind to tell me that I was running out, I will speed up a little bit. And you all know the story that a, a correct model is not always a strong model. And the most famous way to observe that is the location uh, models. The location models are the story told by Gina. And the notebook will enable you to experiment with the so-called compact formulation for an uncapacitated location problem and uh, let's say the non-compact formulation which is the strongest of the two you will see them being modeled here you will see that you can you also have a way to generate a random instances you see uh, the possible locations are the squares the orange squares and the customers are the dots and if i use the solver in this case intentionally a not very strong one I see that the facility location solution by the weak model took like about 30 seconds to find, but it is optimal. And the same instance with the strong model takes just half a second to find, of course, the same solution. So this is a notebook that illustrates uh, two models for the same problem, in this case, a location problem, and tells you how you can actually compare them. Uh, if I go back to my slide deck, the next story is a very, a very interesting story. It's a story about uh, material planning, and it is a story that will actually, if you go through the notebook, you will learn how to become a little bit more handy with pandas, which is a very, very strong tool for data scientists. So basically, what Caroline now realizes is that um, she cannot anticipate to sell all the, all the production. She needs to have like demand forecasts and she got demand forecasts from her data scientists from Hulse, from Elsa and then uh, the demand forecasts are for the next year like 88 football trophies in January and so forth like you see them over here so basically what she wants is to um, have the proper material planning done and the material planning which is part of Hilda's uh, notebook 
has a lot of funny rules. There are different suppliers with different prices. You can read the whole story on the notebook. And if you go through the resolution, uh, you will see that pandas is a very powerful thing. The demand will be read into a data frame. You see it here. You have here a very simple structure that creates the consumption of the materials. And if you want to go from the demand of the of the trophies to the demand of materials, you just do a dot product. It's just like you will do in MATLAB, but you can do it with pandas. And then what you have here is the table of demands for the materials, and then you can go and optimize. This will be the optimization problem and the solution. The solution tells you you should acquire so much, and there are many rules for the inventory costs and all that stuff. It's uh, maybe already a quite challenging model to model, which illustrates a lot of Biomo. And the last one, of course, that this is the moment for you to answer this poll, and I'm curious. You came here for a stream on transportation and logistics, and the question is, are you actually missing routing too much? Yeah, somebody's making me up, you are very kind. But yes, of course, there are people also very honest. I came for a routing, please do some routing, of course. The last example will cover the most important of the routing problems at DSP. And I will illustrate how to solve the TSP in one of the models using Payomo. And if you want to know more about the TSP, I also suggest you to follow offline that beautiful talk by William Cook on the last Euro meeting in Dublin. So I uh, meet Igor. Igor is a TSP. He's a traveling salesman person who has a TSP to solve. And what you may see on my um, Igor's notebook is that indeed we have two basic models. Dunsink, Fulkerson, and Johnson that eliminates the soup tours by uh, an exponential number of constraints and the wonderful compact model of Miller, Tucker, and Zemlin, which is the one that this notebook implements. And as you may see, I generate some, uh, some uh, random instances of the TSP. I start with the bipartite matching kernel of the model. And when I solve the bipartite kernel of the model, the model, I will notice that actually I get a solution only on the diagonal. So I can modify the model by adding constraints to it. And I will do that right here. I will get a model, add constraints to it. The constraint will move me away from the diagonal and I will resolve. And I will see that now I'm out of the diagonal. And if I proceed, I will end up being able to add the Miller, Tucker and Zemlin sub two elimination constraints. And if you go all the way down in my notebook, you will also see that I give you code to get benchmarks from internet and you get a very nice notebook to start doing your routing. But I think I should now stop talking and allow for some Q&A that is still there because basically this is where I wanted to finish. My last story, the story of Igor, was the last I had in mind. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Joaquim, for um, your presentation. So this is just on time. Um, uh, of course, I mean, um, Joaquim will be here for um, a couple of minutes more. So um, if you would like to move to another um, sessions, that should be fine. But if you would like to stay, that also will be fine. So there are um, several interesting questions, uh, Joaquim. Yes. Um, so the uh, most uh, voted one, I will start with that. So. Um, the question is, uh, so I haven't used Payomo in Python for optimization yet. And I was wondering what is available with respect to meta heuristics optimization, both commercial and free? That's a very good question. I actually, I intentionally did not cover the heuristic arena today because it's a, a very fuzzy arena. Uh, heuristics basically require you to program. Um, there are some strong packages on heuristics within domains. For instance, Google has a wonderful package for routing. Um, in the so-called Google OR tools, you may find a wonderful package for routing. You also have Python frontends on famous, uh, famous uh, heuristics like uh, those implemented in Concord. Uh, Payomo is basically a modeling tool in order to call on solvers, to call upon solvers. So if you do Payomo, you are doing mathematical optimization that requires a model to be solved by a solver. Of course, that can be part of a math heuristic. 
not a meta heuristic, but a math heuristic. I do know an example of a math meta heuristic, by the way. It's a very funny one. It's called proximity heuristic, invented by Matteo Fieschetti. And that uses a solver as a black box for a meta heuristic, which will be basically trying to improve uh, MILP solutions uh, iteratively. So uh, PIOMO is not an answer for the question, how do I do heuristics? If I would be touching on heuristics, I would be doing a completely new tutorial, but it would require me to focus on a domain. Then I should be talking only about routing or only about packing or only about a specific domain. If I um, want to be a little bit more general than like I was today, then uh, the common denominator is the modeling. And then we are talking about models that you may try to solve to optimally. Okay, so uh, the <coughs> short answer is no, I do not know of a universal heuristic package. Okay, is there any limitation regarding the problem size that can be modeled in Biomo? For example, number of variables, constraints, and objective? No, there is no single limitation by Biomo itself. There are limitations that can come either from your programming skills or from the solver that you may call upon. The programming skills may lead to Pyoma being very slow, uh, depending on how you use it. If the model is huge, uh, assembling the model, which is what Pyoma does underwater, is that it basically converts your Python into the algebra of the model. Assembling the model can take long if the model is huge. But if you get the hang of Pyoma, then you can do uh, very, very big things. I would think that if you do professional modeling like in AIMS or in GAMS or those packages, then you can do exactly the same with Biome. So it is worth investing knowledge on. Okay, so the following questions has two parts. I will start with the first part. Does uh, Biome work as effectively as direct access uh, to solvers uh, for moderate and large problems? I would expect it to be more efficient than some of the dialects of some solvers. Of course, that I'm not talking about the big three like Gurobi, Cplex, and, uh, and uh, Express from FICO, they do put a lot of effort on having great Python dialects, but Pyomo is uh, at least as good, uh, with the advantage that you can select the solver after you do your model. Of course, that those that are experienced with calling upon solvers will probably think, hey, there are low level usage of solvers that force me to go to the solver, like the use of callbacks. For instance, if I do callbacks, then I need to program against the API of the solver. Well, fortunately, Pyomo also covers that. Pyomo also gives you a protocol for callbacks that will be translated to the callback protocol of any solver that implements those callbacks. So um, I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not involved uh, in Pyomo uh, at all, so I'm not representing Pyomo. But the more I know, of, uh, I learn about it, the more I love it. I've been moving all my uh, Python modeling from different packages. I was doing Pulp before, I was doing other packages, I'm moving it to Pyoma. Okay, so the second part of the uh, question, does it support a generalized method for implementing lazy codes? Yes, I did, cut, I did cover that in, unintendedly just now by saying that, for example, you would feel like you should do Gurobi protocol if you want to do lazy cuts, which are callback cuts. Um, indeed, Pyomo allows you to do that, and there are examples to be, that can be found online. If you reach out to me, I will be also happy to give you a recoding of the TSP, which does lazy generation of super elimination constraints via that way. Okay. Um, the following I found question. that to be a little bit too sophisticated for today, sorry. But uh, you see my email on screen. I will be more than happy to, uh, to cover that for you. Okay. Please, okay. So for the um, um, Gina, uh, Gina example. Yes. Can these methods work with network optimization? That means yes. taking into account roads, uh, yes. roads rather than just Euclidean as the crow flies distance? Yes, uh, Pyomo does include the network extension, uh, which is especially tailor-made for uh, the network structure of a mathematical optimization model. Um, and it does work very well with another package called Network X. A Network X is not, not the same as Pyomo, but Py Pyomo is a modeling tool, and it does indeed enable modeling network problems. And Network X is actually um, 
a package which also includes a lot of uh, network algorithms like shortest path algorithms flow algorithms all that stuff but they um, they can collaborate very well and you can indeed replace your Euclidean distances by any other thing because basically you need to tell to, to the Pyomo implementation of your model to the instance you need to tell what the what the this the distances are and you can acquire them from anywhere there is another thing about Pyomo. I only illustrated what is called a concrete model, which is basically an instance. Pyomo allows you to abstract that into a so-called abstract model. And an abstract model is just a structure of your problem, and it can be bound to the data source after instantiation, which is kind of abracadabra what I'm saying, but it's a very powerful concept. When you are actually creating a sophisticated package, which does optimization at specific points, that's the way to go. Um, okay, so as a last question, what, uh, which uh, complementary libraries do you think are necessary to master using uh, Biomo? Oh yeah, very good question. I already suggested that you learn about Pandas because Pandas is the favorite tool of all the data scientists. And if you ever interact in a multidisciplinary team with a data scientist, he will talk on Pandas. That's one thing. NumPy, NumPy is very worth learning for any Python scientist because NumPy gives you, leverages all the algebra that you are used to get from MATLAB. Uh, into a package. NumPy is really a way to go as well. Um, I would also consider um, learning about, let's see, NumPy. Uh, maybe if you want to do some drawings, Matplotlib, which is actually a mimification of, Mat of MATLAB drawing uh, facilities into Python, but much superior to it. So that's if you want to visualize stuff. And I may also provide, um, if you request that another, um, Notebook, which is actually on on, on activity on job shop scheduling, or I can sh uh, give you a, a, another notebook on that, which uh, uh, also uses very sophisticated uh, visualization libraries as well. So I would say NumPy is a must. Pandas is a good uh, investment as well, and I think you cover a lot from that. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so thank you very much. Of course, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask after. So um, uh, Joaquim has kindly provided all of us of his email address. So please feel free to con uh, contact him directly. If you have also more questions, um, you could uh, still share uh, these questions in the Q&A and probably Joaquim will be provided with these questions and provide the answers after the session. Um, thank you, uh, Joaquim, for the very interesting talk. And thank you all for the attendees for attending um, this session. Um, so this is Ahmed Kerry. Thank you very much all. Thank you all as well. And sorry for taking part of your break. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.